It's Pammy's Pammy's Adventures. <laughs> I promise I haven't lost my mind. Actually, uh, I have a very special guest today. I'm here with Pam Virgo, who is known on YouTube as Pammy, or It's Pammy's Adventures. Mm -hmm. Pammy, uh, like me, is a massive Disney fan. But unlike me, she's actually worked with the company for almost 20 years. Is that right? Yes, indeed. Almost 20 years. <laughs> and so what have you done for the Disney company in those 20 years? Well, hello, hello. Um, what have I done? I was a performer in Disneyland Paris. That's where it started for me in 99. And I've, so I've worked in Disneyland Paris, danced in the shows and in the parade. As they say, the biggest audience you'll ever get is the Disney parades. Um, and then I worked on the cruise lines as well for a couple of years as a performer and also a manager of the characters. Or All right. as I like to say, looking after Mickey Mouse's diary for him and okay. his friends. <laughs> um, and then also there is a special events group that work for, for the Hammersmith office, and they do events all around the, um, I was going to say all around the world, but mostly, mostly in EMEA um, in Africa. That's Europe, Middle East, and Africa, just there you for go. people who might not know. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, and those can be uh, taking the characters on events, store openings, uh, hospital visits, shows, all but, kinds of things. And your YouTube channel is about your adventures working for the Disney company and traveling both either as a cast member or as just a holiday goer. Yeah, and then it's also about... Um, adventures that I've been up to so anything that I've done in life really because I've also I'm a performer an actress a singer a dancer and so I was in the last Star Wars film yeah. um, really yeah as what as a caretaker in that film I was one of the caretakers really so that's the good thing about Star Wars films you're allowed to say okay what, what you did okay the characters that yes you did yeah there. yeah so <laughs> yeah so I had been writing this book and I was scared to share it with anyone and I, I had no idea if if what I was doing made any sense or if it would be how it would be appreciated or received in the Disney fan base and you were literally the first person I shared it with oh well, thank you very much and so <laughs> I kind of uh, shared with you the first couple of chapters and you kind of encouraged me I loved it and, loved it <laughs> and so then I I put it on the internet and you you've heard it so yeah can I ask what did you think give me give me that your honest opinion honest opinion okay well when I first well, as you know, when I when you told me about your book, my first thing was, is it going to be anything derogatory about Disney? Because, you know, I like good stuff and positive things. And you were like, no, 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 it's good. It's good things. It's good things. So I was like, OK, great. Send me a copy. Let me read it. Um, and then it just from the get go, when you have the scene with Walt in the um, looking out the window, already my heart was just feeling I was like emotional about it and just thought, oh, my gosh, this is just I felt like I was there. With him, um, and then when he had the the brother, which Sherman brother, Sherman Richard brother, Sherman. Richard Sherman, um, come and play the song for him, and said that that's his favorite song. It's just, it was just it was so heart heartwarming um, to read about this side of Walt, and to think that he could have been standing or had been standing at the um, looking out on the park while all the people are out there, and, and that's one of his favorite places to be. Um, and so then, and then you had the second part of it was with the uh, businessman, businessman, yeah. and how he links with with Walt, and that's what I'm intrigued by because then, of course, it ended. It was like two chapters, and then <laughs> you, I don't know what's going to happen with them. So I was like, I want to know more. Well, well, can I ask? Did you know that that happened? That so so chapter one is real. That's mm -hmm. fact. Yeah. Right? So, so I knew you, that. Okay, so you had heard that before. Yeah. So I'd heard about the fact that um, that he built. The office, so I wasn't sure. Like that small apartment, yeah, that on small Main apartment. Street, USA. Mm -hmm. um, but that that was a that was all I knew about it. I didn't know. So the you didn't part know about, about the feed the birds and the song no. and the crying. Mm -hmm. Which again, I I read that in the Neil Gabler uh, Walt Disney biography book, which is amazing. I highly recommend everyone go out there and get it. But it was like so few people know about that, and to me, like like with you, it, it just. It made me feel close to him yeah. in a way that I've never felt close to him ever. Yeah. And that just kind of started inspiring me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think also it just it reminds you of, of that he's a human and he has emotions. And that's why Disney is so loved by everybody, because it's a family thing. It's it. it everyone can be involved. It doesn't matter your race, your age. It's, you know, it's for everyone. And yeah. And so I just, yeah. It really got me, that part of the story.
My question would be, why Walt Disney and why Disney? Why do you love Disney so much? <laughs> well, you know, lots of little kids love Walt Disney. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I was certainly no exception. I loved going to Disney World in Florida as a kid. The This book came out of something that happened over, uh, I'm scared to say over a decade ago. <laughs> what really happened was Walt Disney started releasing a bunch of old films from their vault. And they had in these little DVD packages, and I think they called them like Walt Disney Treasures. Mm -hmm. And one of them was, I think, called like Tomorrowland or the Walt Disney's version of the future. And they included Walt's original vision of Epcot. Right. Mm -hmm. And most people don't know this. And but I mean, this was in a Walt Disney released DVD. And it was this video where Walt just walked through that Epcot was always meant to be a city of the future. It was not yeah. supposed to be a theme park. No. Yeah. And I remember now at this point, I'm an adult in law school. So I'm like getting my doctorate from Harvard and I'm like trying to like read contracts. And yet I was, I, I felt like this, this childlike wonder of, oh my gosh, what was it like to like, what would it be like to live in that city of the future? I wanted to live in that city of the future. And in a very weird way, I, I felt, you know, as a kid, I always had wanted to meet Walt Disney, and I was really sad that he had died before I was born, and I felt like that wasn't fair. Yeah. Uh, and it's <laughs> not, but that's life. That, yeah. <laughs> but it was kind of like, I felt like history cheated me. And it's very hard to explain. It was like, I wanted to see that city, and because Walt died, didn't I didn't get version. to see it. And so I felt like history had cheated me somehow. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds really crazy, but as, as once I started to get into kind of shifting away from being a lawyer to being a writer, it was like, you know that, that movie Saving Mr. Banks? Oh, yeah. He mm -hmm. says at the end to Mrs. Travers, he says at the end, like, we're storytellers. We can right the wrongs of the world through our mm. stories. Yeah. And, and so I'd had this long obsession with, Epcot and what it could have been and then that kind of that that throwaway line which who knows if he actually even said that that was probably just a clever line that some writer wrote but it is true yeah that kind of inspired me and then I started rereading all of these Disney biographies I literally went out and read everything I could find mm -hmm. and I wanted to know like what kind of planning had gone into the city and 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 all you know I just I got kind of obsessed and it was fun and it was it was just exciting and I reread this chapter in the Gabler book where he talked about that song. And that really struck a chord with me because I literally spent like weeks, I just, I played that song like in a lot of different spots and I was trying to visualize what was Walt probably thinking and feeling when he was listening to that song and crying. And we keep saying that song actually, but I don't think we've actually said oh, what the song uh, is. No. <laughs> So well, what is the song yeah, we're talking presumably, about? Presumably, well, I think most people who listen to this have probably listened to the uh, yes. to the first episode. But it, it, it was that obsession to feed the birds. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to hide that back because I, I, at least I've imagined or I think having researched everything, I think it's one of two things. I'll, I'll save that for the end of the book or the end of the series or wherever it gets to. But I was just, um, I was once I felt like I knew why he cried at that song, the book just flowed out. Right. Mm -hmm. And it just, um, you know, and it, it flowed out actually relatively quickly. Um, but then I was just constantly, you know, is anyone going to like it? Are people, if I try to explore a different side of Walt, are people going to hate me for it? You know, mm -hmm. how are people going to react? And yet kind of, so I, I literally just, was randomly thinking of hiring an actor and I was like, I need to test this out. Yep. And so I, I, you reacted okay, so I did it. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, Ooh, look at that. So I'm a big thank you to uh, Pam and Pammy's Adventures. Go, I'll put a link on the thing so people can find you. So you. Definitely go subscribe to her page. Um, and that's kind of where it started. I mean, you can, in the chapters that I read, you can, uh, you can feel and read the, the love that you have for it and the, the respect that you have for, um, for Walt and what you're trying to get across. And that's why, like I said, I can't wait to read the rest because, and, I mean, when will that be? <laughs> well, I've, I've started the next episode, so I'll, I'll give you and, and the listeners uh, like a sneak peek. I, the, I'm trying to think now, how much, how much do I give away? Do uh -huh. I give out too much? No. But, but the, the next chapter is about St. Louis. 
because a lot of people don't realize this, the they shopped around, right? Like anybody, you know, they looked around. So they, they when they were looking of, keep in mind, so let's, let's visualize this. It's 1960 something, 1960, 1961. You know, Disneyland is a massive success, but 75% of America's population was on the East Coast, mm-hmm. 75%. And keep in mind, people didn't fly back then the way they fly around now. So the company knew there was just a massive untapped market if they could put it on the East Coast. So they were looking for places. So one of the places they looked at was New York, but property is expensive, it's cold, and and New York Manhattaners aren't going to be the type that love Disney. So they were looking for places a little bit warm, but they also looked at St. Louis because Walt spent his childhood in Missouri. And... Walt, they St. Louis put together a proposal, mm-hmm. and people don't realize uh, Anheuser Busch, the big alcohol company, was a big sponsor of a potential Disney park in St. Louis. And Walt Disney said, "Oh, that's all well and good, uh, but you can't sell alcohol in my park." Uh, yeah, and that's and, and kind of what they do. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so I, that kind of fell out. So that's where it started. But I, but I also kind of explore what. Walt's original vision for Epcot was, I don't know if I'll get this to this Epcot, this might be episode four rather than episode three, but he said it was Kennedy's assassination. Mm. He was surveying places, and once he got the news that the president had been assassinated, he was like, okay, I, it, it, it can't just be a theme park. It's got to be about something greater than me, my company, and it's got to be a gift to the world. And that really inspired yeah. him too, right? Because mm-hmm. that's, 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 here's this great man with all this fame and wealth and prestige. And he's thinking, he, he was thinking bigger. Yeah. It was like, how do I change the world? Um, and that just got to me because, uh, you know, I, I have a little bit of a background in politics and that's going to come out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because <laughs> if you're building a city, right, you're going to have politicians, you know, yeah. and, and Walt was close to some politicians that of people course, don't realize yeah, sure. that. Uh, he gave, in, in one sense, when Disneyland opened, a lot of people don't know this, uh, Ronald Reagan was one of the announcers. Yes, he was on the, yeah. Now, he wasn't I mean, famous at that no, point. But before he did but, his, his yeah, speech that everyone knows. Um, but I believe... I believe Ronald Reagan, I, I, I'll need to fact check this, but Ronald Reagan, I think, was governor of California at the time Walt passed. Right. So they would have known each other. Mm-hmm. And Richard Nixon, who at the point was vice president, he came to Disneyland for the opening of the monorail in 1959. Mm. Right. The other thing was, you know, I've always been a, a huge American political history buff. I always loved Lyndon Johnson. And I kind of was literally trying to invent a situation where the Walt Disney and Lyndon Johnson met. <laughs> of course, you Google it, and it comes right up. They actually met. Ah. Oh. And it did not go well either. Oh. So that's great for that's great fodder for a writer. Mm-hmm. So in 1964, Lyndon Johnson is campaigning for president. He invites all these wealthy, prestigious, not wealthy, but he invites all these prestigious artists to the White House to give them prestigious awards. And that was his way of kind of trying to be like, oh, you, you endorse, you're endorsing me, right? Like, mm-hmm. I'm giving you this Medal of Freedom or Medal of Honor. You're endorsing me. Walt Disney saw it for what it was. And Walt Disney was a, a massive Republican. And so at the time, a Republican senator named Barry Goldwater was campaigning against Lyndon Johnson. So Walt goes to the White House, accepts his award, <laughs> and puts this big Goldwater button on his lapel. Right. And and then shakes the president's hand, gets his award, and flies right back home. Right, uh, it's perfect. I mean, you you. It's funny because the the family tried to like not somewhat hide. I think the company somewhat tried to hide that, but I was right. like, why? They I didn't mean, make it like, do. It, it was that was Walt. He had a mis- he had a mischievous side. Mm-hmm, he thought mm-hmm. he was being funny. He didn't like it. Wasn't massively offensive, and he didn't like you know what I mean. But it was like you're not going to use me. To campaign against your rival when I support your rival. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So all that's kind of I, a lot of people have to know the history of Walt in the '60s, and and you know I'm also just trying to tell a story. Like you, there are books that kind of just walk you through the technical aspects of Epcot. Yeah, of, yeah exactly. And that's that's interesting. Yeah, because there, there's a lot of interesting things that people don't know. Like like Walt was going to have it that uh, it was going to have a completely. Um, like all the trucks would run underground, yeah. So um. you would never see delivery trucks on the the anywhere in Walt Disney World. People don't know this. 
Um, Walt, to this day, this is still legally binding, Walt Disney World has the right to build a nuclear power plant. Right, okay. Yeah, because, <laughs> because Walt's thing was my city of the future will have its own energy. Wow. Um, so, you know, it, but you have to have some story to that too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, you know, and I, I, and there's just, for me, there was just so much to explore and, and, um, I just got excited as you can kind of see, I can, can get yeah, really there, I mean, there away. is a lot to, yeah, there's a lot to explore about it. And so why do you feel like you've chose, I suppose you can, you've answered the question really, but you know, why did you choose Epcot? Some people would say, you know, well, how come you didn't choose the Magic Kingdom or, you know, other parts of Disney? Why? Well, no, it was because I wanted to live in Epcot. Right. You didn't want to live in the castle. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I would love to spend a night in Walt's secret apartment in uh-huh. Disneyland. That yes. would be really cool. Yeah, it would be. Because um, you can kind of imagine what that, he did that a lot with his grandkids. Like, how yeah. cool would that be to be a little kid and get to, like, sleep on the sofa in mm-hmm. Disneyland and wake up? And, and Walt was an amazing storyteller, right? So I'm yeah. sure he would have been telling the kids stories of Pinocchio or just random adventures. Um, but the idea of living in a you know a city of the future Tomorrow, yeah where cuz Walt in a weird way like everyone would have a job everyone would have a home mm-hmm. so everyone so in a weird way he wanted to take care of the residents of Epcot right so you would and it was a home where you walked out the door and there was a people mover yeah right have you ever ridden that that thing at uh oh the like the travelator uh, yeah yeah oh yeah and it goes around in a circle yeah i can't remember the song oh great big that beautiful great tomorrow, big tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the whole point and it's got the dog so you can kind of see like yeah. so i'm i'm just for reference purposes uh, I've got the video up in front of uh, me and Pam, and and we're seeing the old. I, I highly recommend to any of my listeners, Google Epcot concept on YouTube and watch that old video of where he's proposing Epcot to Florida. Yeah. Um, and you walk out of your home, and there's a people mover. Then that takes you to a transportation center, and then you ride a monorail to work. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then you work either in the Magic Kingdom Park or in the hotel or in the shops. But Walt's vision was, if we think hard enough, and his thing was he was also going to partner with large corporations. So it was like, if if governments and corporations can work together for the betterment of mankind, we can end problems like homelessness. Mm -hmm. And we can end, or at least significantly reduce crime. So, I mean, if you can kind of see, like, so he had, like, high-rise apartments where people could live in. He also had more suburban areas. And it was just like... Um, and the, the homes of Epcot would be constantly changing because if a, a sponsoring corporation came up with a new product, They'd the citizens of Epcot would get it. Mm-hmm. So there was just this massive thing of like, oh, I want to live there. And what would that would be, be like? That, but then yeah. there are all sorts of other problems. Like, well, what happens if you don't get to live in Epcot? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What if the, what about the people who want to live in Epcot and didn't get to live there? Yeah. You know, there are all these different issues. A massive issue, which I'm really going to explore is voting in Epcot Ah. because technically is Epcot a city and if it's if it is technically a city then people have the right to vote for a mayor Uh but if it's not a city you don't yeah so who decides that and and Walt paid lawyers a a fair chunk of money to try to deduce what to do with that right so which is gonna that would also bring in some of more of the the conflict with politicians uh to make it kind of real so it's Mm -hmm. not just you know me living in a magical city with people movers and monorails all the time (laughs) because there there were all these other problems uh at the same time it's just one of these things i I, you know i'm sure lots of millions of people around the world wish he had lived longer than he did yeah yes but but there's this thing of if he had lived another five or ten years what would have happened yeah and i and i think you know in a weird way the disney company is afraid of that story and I think, which is one reason I, I reached out to you, because I'm a super fan, you're mm-hmm. a super fan. Yeah. My thing to them is don't be afraid of that story. Um, embrace it, mm-hmm. you know, and hire me to write it for ah! you. Like, <laughs> you know, like, I'm here, like, I have a book, I have ideas, I'm, I'm you know, Bob Iger, Agnes <laughs> Chu, give me a call. Um, but that's, you know, because I have sympathy for why it didn't get built the way that it did. 
Um, because if you think about it, 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 you have to visualize these things. Mm -hmm. Walt Disney died suddenly. Yeah. People, he was diagnosed with cancer, I think, in November of 1966. He was dead within two months. Yeah. Wow. He didn't see Christmas 1966. So, no, yeah, because he died on the 15th. So, so that was one thing. So there was no time to plan for a successor. Um, his brother was meant to retire, right? So you got to yeah. get Roy Disney was eight years older. So, so there's a very, I think I, I, I I'm scared because I wrote this in the book and I'm like, I can't remember if I made this up or this is in the biography. <laughs> so I don't know if it's fact or fiction, but there's this thing of Roy had been promising his wife like this, you know, this month long holiday. They were going to take a cruise. He was going to take her to the Hawaii, you know, this magical holiday they had planned and then mm -hmm. Walt dies and, and then mean. everyone looks to him. Yeah. And the thing is, Roy was not creative, right? He was a businessman yeah. and yeah. he was a brilliant businessman though because Walt would get himself into trouble. Yeah, and then he would get him out of it. So, so, but imagine from Roy's perspective, like, I've been promising my wife for 20 years yeah. I'm going to take her on a vacation. <laughs> then my baby brother dies. No one knows what to do with the company. They, they were going to drop Florida altogether. They were just going to have nothing. Wow. So he was like, let me build the theme park, and that's for y'all to figure out later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, look... Uh, 70 year old men shouldn't be working 80 hour day or not 80, 80 hour weeks mm -hmm. 16 17 hour days roy passed within three months of the magic kingdom of florida being opened yeah so then he died then what yeah exactly so then it was it? all dropped on card walker and and i think don tatum who you know didn't quite Get it. <laughs> well, or, but the flip side was, in order for Epcot to have really worked, you would have had to have massive sponsorships from large corporations, and Walt was the face of the company. Yeah, so when he's gone. And so, one Roy, I don't think was, was that just wasn't who he was, was to do that kind of thing. Yeah. And then, you know, when there's no Disney at the top of the Disney company, how do you get 50 corporations to invest? So it, it, it may have not have been a reality. Not to mention, by this point, we're talking, it's, it, you know, at this point, it's 1975. We're getting into the 80s. And then, of course, you know, the the businessman, I'm, I'm finagling some facts there. But the Walt Disney Corporation did almost get taken over in 1983. Right. Do people know that? I mean, like, do, do you as a fan kind of uh, maybe heard something? I think I heard something, but, yeah, not the deep ins and outs of it. So... It's it's around 1982-1983. This is the the time of big business mergers and acquisitions. The you know business is booming on Wall Street. Yeah. You know that movie Wall Street with uh, mm -hmm. I think Michael, Michael Douglas, Douglas. Race's Greed is good. That's the era. The Disney Corporation had a, had had a few movies that were not so successful. Mm -hmm. um, the theme park admissions were. I mean, it was kind of tailoring off. I mean, it, it, the, it, there wasn't any real expansion. In, in essence, those revenues had flattened out a bit. Mm -hmm. And basically, a very smart businessman who had made it his job to take over companies saw like, hmm, the company has all of these movies that are in circulation in the vault, has all these you know cartoons, has these two theme parks, and the stock price is trading on the floor. Mm -hmm. He started secretly buying the stock. And, and he, um, you know, he kind of, I, I don't know how much he got. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was either 5% or 8%, but basically but before Disney knew what was happened, they were about to be taken over. Wow. And then not to mention it on Wall Street, once there's blood in the water, everyone's going to want a piece of it, right? Mm -hmm. So he was, he was, he was the father of what they call green mail, which is where he would buy enough of your company to scare you into... He would basically blackmail you into buying him out. Oh, okay. So that was a real person. I'm really, I don't want to, we won't get too much into that. That nearly happened to the Disney company. But the, the man who first did that, his first hostile takeover happened in 1968. And so I just literally said, well, rather than having him do that in 1968, what if he did it in 1965? Okay, yeah. So that's where that comes in. Right. And, and, because it, it, I just thought that was kind of cool to bring that in because, you know, 
every protagonist has to have an antagonist. Yeah, that's it, exactly. And that's him. Um, so, yeah. So, I, I hope I haven't talked your ear off. No, not at all, not at all. I mean, we all want to know why, the main reason of why you are doing this in the first place. And, of course, the, one of the main reasons is just your fascination and love for it from, uh, you said, a young age. Um, and then, I, I mean, I love the fact you get so excited about about it. And, you know, you guys can't see, but his face is beaming <laughs> when he talks about it. I do it. get really excited about it because it's something where I I think people would love it. Mm-hmm. And even if now, you know, let's say they, they tried to build it now, you know, the future of 1965 is going to be very different than 2019, mm-hmm. right? So people movers and monorails have been around for almost a century now you know like any any new technology they would have had in the 60s around you know devices in your home that's going to be passe but it's still something to think about and it's it's no matter what level he was at his life Walt Disney was very much about dreaming yes and he's about dreaming big and dreaming of the future and he was in optimist when it came to the future and so many people are pessimists yeah exactly um and and one thing I haven't done in the book, which I think I'm going to rectify, is he was really close to Ray Bradbury, the science fiction author. Right. And Ray Bradbury was a consultant on Epcot. And so I'm like, uh, you know, I only found that out last week. Oh, so I'm okay. like, I got to write that in, <laughs> right? So, because it's, it's, I got to put that in there. So it was just, it's, you know, man, it's, it's okay if man's reach extends past what he's able to grasp. Right. So it, it's okay to dream about a future where we have a blueprint of corporations and governments and visionaries like Walt working together to solve the problems of humanity. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And frankly, I just love imagining what it would be like to get to live in that city of the future. Yeah. And I've got enough of a background of law and politics and writing that I can kind of, I feel like, Stay true to his vision, but stir the pot a little bit. Uh-huh. So yeah. thank you, I, Pam. I mean, your encouragement. You have no idea what that means to me. Oh, it's so lovely. So yeah. thank you so much for both reading the script, listening to it, <laughs> and being on my podcast. And again, do you want to? You've got how? You've got how many channels do you have? <laughs> you got more than one. So I've got my channel, which is uh, Pamela Virgo channel, which is Pammy's Adventures, and then I also have a children's channel. Um, called Bop and Boogie that I write original songs on there and um, and have children's skits and things on that channel as well. Okay, yeah. and you've been with the Disney company for almost 20 years, on and off for almost... Oh, so yeah, so I'm on and off for um, the company and it's been on and off uh, freelancing in some cases and then um, obviously when I was on the ship there was contract basics, um, contract bases. Um, so yeah, so... and. Also, I suppose you have to throw in there that everything that I'm saying is all what I believe and and yeah. I'm not affiliated with the Disney company. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, neither am I. I'm going to put that in the disclaimer. I wish I were. Again, like I'm waiting for Bob Iger to call me. There you go. Um, but so, yeah. So if adults who love Disney, you can tune into mine and then you can sit your kids in front of <laughs> Pam and Pammy's adventures. Yeah, and, you go. And the Bop and Boogie and... Yep. and Get the whole shebang. See well, Pam, thank you on. so much. Um, and yeah, if you ever need me to be on your podcast, you know where to reach me. Oh, most <laughs> definitely. Yes, indeed. He's going to come and join me on my adventures. <laughs> and again, uh, please like and subscribe if you've enjoyed this podcast. I promise I'm going to have more content coming soon. Uh, I've also recently uh, launched a Patreon channel, Andrew Creates. So if you're in a position to drop me some support because these episodes are not cheap Mm. Uh, but if you're in a position to help great if not please a like and subscribe is equally appreciated and please uh, like and subscribe Pam's channels as well I'll put links to that at the bottom in the in the text so Pam thank you so much thank you bye bye